All right, assalamu alaikum everyone. I am Farah Abu Rub. I'm a third year medical student and for today I'm going to be giving you guys the beginning or the first part of our immunology crash course. Within this lecture, we are going to be, I think there's a lag, but we'll we'll get over that, it's fine. So within this lecture, we are going to be going over the innate immunity, antigens and antibodies, and immunogenetics. For the coming lecture on Thursday, inshallah, I'll be covering the complements, MHC and antigen presentation, and we're going to be doing some practice questions on flowcharts. I understand this seems pretty heavy, but we'll get through it, inshallah. You guys have got this. I'll make it as simple as possible. We'll get through this as quickly as possible, and I'll make sure to give you guys breaks along the way. So if at any point you have any question for me, please feel free to ask. I don't mind whatsoever. If I have to repeat the same thing over and over and over again, that's completely okay as long as I'm able to deliver the message to you guys. Now, for the actual content included in the slides, my resource was mainly your batch's transcriptions because I wanted to stay as true to Dr. Garwin as possible. However, for certain topics where I felt he might have made it a bit too difficult, I have used my own notes and I will be including them, inshallah, either in the notes section or in the slides themselves. Without further ado, I want to talk to you guys about the immune system. Now, with regards to the immune system, a lot of the issue arises in the fact that people try to just take it as a book. People try to look at it and they're like, oh, there's so much. Everything seems so similar. I don't understand how this relates to anything. Well, we are here to change that. Uh, the voice is lagging a bit. Is anyone else facing that issue? All right. All right, perfect. All right, all good. Just a second, let me put the chat. All right. So the immune system is commonly looked at as a whole big picture and it can be somewhat overwhelming. So I would like to introduce you guys to the immune system, a play that is written and directed specifically for you. So we are going to be looking at the different characters of this play. We're going to start to get used to them. We're gonna to get to know them a bit. And then we're gonna carry them with us through every single step of the way. And I want you guys to try to get very familiar with those characters. Think of them as some friends that you're meeting. And through that, we'll be able to link everything together, hopefully a lot better. So first of all, when you think of immune system, you, would probably think of, oh, okay, I've done HLS. I think of lymphocytes, right? Or I think of uh, like neutrophils, which is perfect. But for now, I would like you guys to meet our four-year-old boy and our eight-year-old boy. The four-year-old boy loves to help his brother so, so, so much. He tries his best to always be there for him. He tries his best to support him. And he also tries his best to support their babysitter. All right? The eight-year-old boy, look at his biceps right there. He is flexing on you guys. He is super strong. He is living his best life. And although he's just an eight-year-old, I'd say he has some anger management issues. And he likes to just go around fighting everyone. But it's all for the sake of protecting his family, of course. Now, I mentioned a babysitter. Our babysitter is about, let's say, 19 to 20 years old. And she always alarms the boys about stranger danger. As their babysitter, she's consistently trying to present them with new information. And because of that, she always has some kind of presentation due. Now, she's 19 to 20 years old, which is basically our age. And look at us. Look at how busy we are. And we constantly have something due, right? And she constantly has a presentation due. Now those two, or those three, have a grandpa in their neighborhood. This grandpa has such crippling anxiety that his hair is standing on end at all times. He's always leaning forward. He's always super, super, super aware of everyone that's around him. This is a 56-year-old man. I think my pointer disappeared, but it's fine. He is a 56-year-old man. Is that not working? Uh, is it switching for you guys? Okay, I think I think it moved now. So his hair keeps on standing on end 
so much that he kind of almost looks like a neuron. And he's always the first responder to new faces. As someone with anxiety, he consistently is on a lookout. All right? We have our three. Now let's move on. Looking at this side, I may or may not have forgotten to add animations to this character right here. So we'll just get back to it in a second. Now, I'm going to be introducing you guys to even more characters in our play. This is a 14-year-old boy who has a huge appetite. He's always hungry for something. He's always on the lookout. He always wants food. Okay? And when he's not eating, he's asleep. And he's sleepwalking. All right? But he's so lovable that everyone just gives him nicknames. Wherever he goes, everyone's giving him a nickname. Now, his very close friend, you can see she's super cool. She's doing a wave with her hands, is a 15-year-old girl who has freckles that she uses to her advantage because freckles are pretty cute. Now, as you can see, she has multiple buns on her head. And the more stressed out she is, the longer she spends getting ready. So she has even more buns. Also, she's a germaphobe. And as someone that is a germaphobe myself, I get super picky whenever I feel like there's bacteria on anything. However, people must have a hobby. So for our 15-year-old girl, she likes fishing. Now, our 15-year-old girl with her freckles also has a family that all has freckles, including this one. She blushes pink and she has seasonal allergies because she's super, super shy. You can see that her cheeks are getting pink for you. And you can see that she has those freckles as well. Now, because she's shy, she's telling you, oh my God, stop it. Now her twin sister looks very similar, except she has a lot more freckles. And she has this curly hair that she doesn't really know how to take care of. So it's very irritable, all right? So both of those are super sensitive. They're twins that are very alert, let's say. If you tell them anything wrong, they might blow up on you. All right, our final set of characters is first of all, this one. He's the, let's say, black sheep of the family. He's somewhat of an introvert and no one really sees him around. He's barely ever there. Secondly, we have this guy who's wearing a very big oversized t-shirt and it always makes him look so much bigger than he actually is. Now, He's such a good friend, however, that whenever his friends are facing any difficulty, whenever their heart is broken or whenever they're bleeding, if they have the tiniest, tiniest wound, he rips off part of his sweater and he gives it to them to wrap up this wound. Finally, my personal favorite, I spend a very long time drawing all of these characters, if you guys couldn't already tell. This one, he skips leg day clearly, is our bodyguard. And he's 100% natural, no testosterone whatsoever. He is consistently on the lookout for anyone that seems like they're pretending to be something that they're not. They're catfishing us. So I just introduced you guys to a bunch of characters. Let's try to link those back to our actual immune system. And how would they possibly make sense? Our immune system, the play, has a setting in the human body. Our characters include lymphocytes, dendritic cells, macrophages, and granulocytes. And the plot is an invader that comes into the human body. But the lymphocytes, or your adaptive immune system, are taking a power nap and are unable to fight it off. The remaining cells, your innate immune system, are trying to wake them up and educate them on stranger danger. All right. Transitioning onto our first lecture, which is innate immunity. First of all, I would like to talk to you guys about the different types of cells that we have within our innate immune system. So first of all, there's this cell that looks like it has a bunch of lobes, right? This is our CD15 positive cells and they are antigen presenting cells. Now what that means, I'll be getting to later on inshallah. See all of those little granules that it has, like it has them on their cheeks? This means that it is a granulocyte. 
And those granules include proteolytic enzymes like myeloperoxidase that it releases and use it, uses to its advantage when it's faced with a bacteria because it is a germaphobe, all right? So this cell is the most abundant in our white blood cell population. Now, it likes to also form what is known as nets or nuclear extra extracellular traps. Nuclear extracellular traps are basically when it releases its own proteolytic enzymes, it releases its own lysosomal enzymes, but because of all of this blowing up, it ends up killing itself as well. However, as Gen Z, we all know that death isn't necessarily a bad thing. So from its death, it creates this slimy, sticky substance that extracellular bacteria can readily attach to. Does this remind you guys of any of our characters? It reminds me personally of our 15-year-old girl who has freckles, who is who loves fishing uh, for the nets, who is a germaphobe, and this is our neutrophil. So far, so good. Are you guys following along? All right, perfect. All right, next we have this type of cell. And looking at it here, it kind of looks like it has an open mouth. I don't know if I'm the only one that sees it, but that's what it looks like to me. So this is a CD14 positive anti antigen presenting cell. Its primary job is phagocytosis, which is basically eating up cells or debris. And it removes microbes, it removes dead cells during embryogenesis, and it maintains homeostasis. It also recruits and activates the effector cells to the site of infection by producing cytokines and chemokines. Cytokines and chemokines are basically very fancy ways of saying attractants, okay? So the way that our body cells communicate with one another is through those attractants, which are cytokines or chemokines. They either secrete them or they respond to them, but they are a very prominent recurring theme that we're gonna be looking at, all right? So these types of cells are regulate like regulatory of the adaptive immune response and they promote wound repair. Does this remind you guys of anyone? Personally, it reminds me of our 14 year old who loves to eat. Now, what about him just being asleep when he's not eating? Well, it's because these monocyte macrophages remain dormant as monocytes circulating in the body, sleepwalking, until they actually reach a pathogen or food, where they wake up, they activate, and they become macrophages. All right, next step, we have this type of cell. And I think you guys are already following along with me by now. I think you know where I'm going with this. These types of cells are once again, professional antigen presenting cells. In their native state, they have a high phagocytic ability. And this correlates heavily with them being antigen presenting cells because of something that I will be mentioning later on. Just keep that in the back of your mind. So once a pathogen is ingested, let's say it's a bacteria, the antigenic proteins of that pathogen are going to be degraded into short peptides. And this is going to be presented on the surface receptors to B and T lymphocytes of the adaptive immune system. What this means is basically, it is going to eat something up and then spit it out for you to see, like, and figure out what kind of possible food it had just eaten. I know that's somewhat like disgusting, but you'll understand more when I link it back to our character. So as part of their antigen presenting cell function, they express co-stimulatory molecules on their membrane that are needed to activate lymphocytes. And they also produce cytokines to simulate lymphocyte activation. Now looking at this right here, it reminds me heavily of this guy's hair. And I told you guys he looks like a neuron because this is called a dendritic cell. Now, when you guys think of a very old man, you might think like, oh, He's gonna be picky about his food, so he might spit it out. So you could try to link that back to professional antigen presentation. All right, next up, we have this type of cell, which you can see has a lot of granules once again. So could it possibly be related to our granule family with freckles? Potentially, right? 
So mast cells are usually fixed within tissues. So the antigen kind of has to come to them rather than them going to the antigen, all right? But they're usually located around blood vessels. And the reason for that is that they contain dense granules with histamine. Do you guys know what histamine is mainly used for? Can anyone <laughs> tell me what? histamine is used for. All right, perfect. Allergy, allergic reactions, vasodilation, perfect. All right, bronchodilation. Uh, it's bronchoconstriction, actually, because yes, good job, good job. All right. All right. So you guys are saying all of those things, and they all link back to allergies, right? So when I think of an allergic reaction, I want you guys to consider what's going to happen. First of all, this mast cell, I just ruined its name, but this mast cell is going to secrete its histamine granules, okay? And it's going to lead to an allergic hypersensitivity response. And that includes everything that you guys mentioned, increased vascular permeability, bronchoconstriction, vasodilation. You guys did an absolutely wonderful job. There's nothing else I could add, all right? So now does this remind you guys of anything? Personally, it reminds me of the twins and it reminds me particularly of the twin with so many freckles. And she has this curly hair that she doesn't know how to deal with because she's hypersensitive, all right? And finally, we have our last type of cell, which looks a lot like a regular lymphocyte, if you guys remember back in HLS, but it's actually not. So it's a large granular lymphocyte, quote unquote, that's derived from the same progenitor as lymphocytes, but it's not a T or a B cell. So what could it possibly be? This type of cell is important in the defense against virus infected tumor cells and dying or stressed cells. All right. So when a virus infects a cell, it likes to do this thing where it tries to hide from the immune system. It tries to be like, oh, no. Don't present any sort of antigen. Don't tell the immune system that I'm here. I'm just going to hide. Actually, I don't think you should present anything. Just don't be suspicious whatsoever. But our very smart lymphocyte-like cell here realizes that, oh, this cell should be presenting something, but it's not. This thing that it should be presenting is known as a human leukocyte antigen or an HLA. These human leukocyte antigens are supposed to be present on all body cells, all right? When they're not, that means that there's something that is actively trying to hide from the immune system. Those types of cells are called natural killer cells. And link them, linking them back to our play, it is this very buff dude that skips like day every single time. Now, remember how he was a bodyguard, he was on the lookout for catfishing, and he is just doing an absolutely wonderful job. Now. We're gonna make him look just, we're gonna nerf him just a slight, slight bit, and we're gonna make him look like this. What I was just explaining to you guys is how natural killer cells actively seek out missing self or this missing HLA, which typically presents as MHC, all right? I know those terms might be a bit confusing, but try your best to follow along with me. So HLA or human leukocyte antigens present as MHC. And when a cell does not have MHC or it's lacking this MHC, the natural killer cell is super smart. It's going to be like, oh, you don't have an ID. You can't go in, for example. All right. And it ends up killing the cell. However, if the cell is presenting MHC, it realizes, oh, OK, yeah, this is this is one of my people. I'm not going to do anything to possibly harm them. Now, I just mentioned a bunch of things to you guys. So I thought it would be best to try to sum it up into a table that gives you everything that you need to know. So those three in blue are our adaptive immune system, while the remaining ones in green are our innate immune system, okay? So our T helper cell, which was the first guy we saw, who was a four-year-old that really likes to help out, was our CD4 T helper cell, all right? The T helper cell, as I mentioned to you guys, really likes to help out and it really loves its brother and it really loves their babysitter. 
So the brother is the cytotoxic T cell, which is CD8 positive, our eight-year-old who has super buff biceps and he tries to fight everything and he tries to eliminate intracellular pathogens and cancers. Given that we know who this is, who's the babysitter? Now, babysitter, change the S to C and we get B cell. Now, our B cell, I told you, is about 19 to 20 years old. And those are the CD markers. However, Dr. Garwin preferred to mention CD10 to you guys. So just remember it as this is the only one that has two markers. So I'm going to divide the 20 by two and I'll get CD10. Now, the B cell consistently has a presentation due, right? It always has something it wants to present. And what it presents is antibodies, all right? Those antibodies and those cytotoxic T cells and everything that surrounds them would not be able to function properly if not for the help of our CD4 T helper cell. Next, we have our old 56-year-old man who was hypervigilant and he's super, super aware of everything going on around him. So he tries to activate the babysitter, he tries to activate our four and eight-year-old, and he tries to warn them consistently. So he presents antigens to them and he activates our adaptive immune system. Macrophages, who is are always hungry, were our 14-year-old, and they are involved with phagocytosis. Neutrophils, who was our yellow squiggly line, squiggly arms, uh, is our 15-year-old, and she is a germaphobe that really gets irritated in bacterial infections. All right. Now, our the first pink twin that we had, who was also very sensitive, was our eosinophil. And the outcast of the family the black sheep of our, the family, who was just super introverted and we barely know anything about him, was our basophil. Both of these are involved with hypersensitivity reactions and parasitic infections. Now, lastly, we had that red guy who was wearing a super large sweater and he would consistently tear pieces off of it. That is our megakaryocyte. And those small pieces that he's tearing off are the platelets. All right, that gives you guys everything about all the types of cells of the innate immune system. Is everything clear so far before I move on? All right, perfect. All right. So I kept on mentioning to you guys antigen presentation, antigen presentation, antigen presentation. What does that even really mean? So the same cells that we have that go through antigen presentation are the cells that have phagocytic ability. Phagocytic ability just means that this type of cell is capable of, um, my pointer keeps on disappearing, I'm sorry. Our bacterial cell, our cell, sorry, is capable of detecting a pathogen or an antigen, and it's capable of ingesting it and then doing something to that pathogen such that it can alert the rest of the immune system. So this is called the process of phagocytosis. It is done by our macrophages, by our neutrophils, and by our dendritic cells, all of which are considered professional antigen-presenting cells. Uh, someone is unmuted. All right. Now, the process of phagocytosis starts when we have an offending agent, which is considered an antigen in this case. We have attachment and adherence of this antigen, which is a bacteria, or it could be anything else, but for the sake of simplicity, let's go with the bacteria. It's going to attach to the plasma membrane of our professional antigen presenting cells. This plasma membrane is going to begin to envelop around this antigen.
and I have been here. I have been here this entire time. All right. So, as I was saying before, I was rudely interrupted by my Wi-Fi. When we have a bacteria or an antigen that it presents to an antigen presenting cell or a professional antigen presenting cell, and that includes our macrophages, our neutrophils, and our dendritic cells, what they're going to do is after attachment and adherence of this antigen, the plasma membrane is going to try to envelop this target, all right? It's going to start to, let's say, pull its membrane inwards where this antigen attached, and then, or this pathogen, sorry, attached, and then it is going to pinch in on the outside to close up a full vacuole around this pathogen, all right? This vacuole that this pathogen is contained in is called a phagosome. Phagocytosis, phagosome, it makes perfect sense to me so far. Now, a phagosome is going to join with a lysosome, which is something that we already always have within a cell. So the phagosome is what is new, but the lysosome is what we already always have. This phagosome is going to fuse with the lysosome to give me a phagolysosome. This phagolysosome is either going to just completely destroy this pathogen and then present it, or it's going to destroy most of it and release some of it. Now, if it were to release some of it, it's usually going to be a neutrophil because she just didn't care much. She was like, yeah, whatever. I don't I, like I, I got bored of this. Just let it go. But our macrophage and our dendritic cell are actually going to take this content of the phagolysosome after its degradation, and they're going to start presenting it on receptors. Now, what could those receptors possibly be? I mentioned to you guys that we want to always make sure that our immune system knows that it is itself and it knows when there is an aggravating intruder or an outsider, just like I told you guys with viruses that hide from natural killer cells. So similar to how we had MHC there, we are also going to be having MHC here. And I won't be going into too much detail about those, because I'm going to have the entire lecture on them on Thursday, inshallah. But just keep that in mind. So MHC is present on all normal cells, but MHC is also used for antigen presentation. So they have to be at least two different types. All right, now I was talking to you guys about self and non-self. How do we actually recognize non-self? Well, in macrophages, neutrophils, and dendritic cells, when they are unable to recognize a pathogen or they're looking at something that is foreign to them, they're going to start generating an immune response. And how would they do that is by recognizing something known as a pattern-associated molecular pattern or PAMPs. So a PAMP is something that is fundamentally non-self. It is abnormal, it is obsolete, as in it is too old and it should be dead. Whether that is intracellular, intracellularly or extracellularly. We have two main types of PAMPs, microbial associated molecular patterns or MAMPs and damage associated molecular patterns or DAMPs. Now from the name, microbial associated is typically going to be associated with bacterial cell wall constituents like LPS, dicoic acid. And I'm sure you guys love micro so, so much so you know exactly what I'm talking about. But lipopolysaccharide is what makes gram negative bacteria gram negative. It is what causes it to take up that color. Dicoic acid is basically the equivalent of this LPS in a gram-positive bacteria. Viral double-stranded RNA and fungal polysaccharides are also all recognized as MAMPs, and they aggravate the immune system. Now, DAMPs, or damage-associated molecular patterns, once again, from the name, there's some kind of damage happening to us. So when the cells are too old, when they undergo apoptosis, when they undergo necrosis, which are things that you guys are also taking in pathology, they're going to start releasing a bunch of things, right? All of their intracellular uh, factors are going to be outside. That includes heat shock proteins, nuclear proteins, RNA, DNA, mitochondrial enzymes, and ATP. 
However, although we have this huge reaction, we don't have a pathogen that is actually stimulating it, right? So this is a sterile sort of inflammation. This isn't something that is pathogenic. This isn't something that is infective per se. All right, so far so good. I'm gonna keep on checking in with you guys. Part of it is to make sure that you're still paying attention. All right, so we have those PAMs. How are we actually able to recognize them? What do we do to know that, okay, like, sure, I have a foreign body. If I am not able to recognize that it's a foreign body, then what's the path, what's the, what's the point? So in order to actually recognize these PAMs and DAMs, Phagocytes, lymphocytes, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, all express receptors that are capable of recognizing these PAMs. And these are known as pattern recognition receptors or PRRs. Immuno really likes summing things up into three letters. So just try your best not to get things mixed up. And I'll try my best to help you guys in remembering them as well. Now, pattern recognition receptors or PRRs can be classified into three main types. TAL-like receptors, or TLRs, NOD-like receptors, or NLRs, and RIG-like receptors, or RLRs. What is each type, and what does it do? So TLRs, I understand this is a lot, but I'm going to go through it and make it as simple as possible. TLRs are present on the extracellular membranes of phagocytic cells. And some of these receptors can also be found intracellularly in the membranes of the endocytosis vacuoles. Let's go back to our picture and try to make that make sense. Now you can see this cell right here. I have a TLR or a tall-like receptor here, and I have one right here as well. Looking at this picture, once again, I have this nod-like receptor, which is intracellular, and re this rig-like receptor, which is also intracellular. So the only one that can really actively detect something that is extracellular is our tall-like receptor. All right, so tall-like receptors, particularly, I want you guys to remember TLR4, it's going to recognize the lipopolysaccharides of a gram-negative bacteria. It is going to recognize those PAMPs, and then it's going to generate an innate inflammatory response. Now, those PAMPs being inside the cell signifies an intracellular immune response. When the cells get infected by a virus, for example, because viruses always go intracellularly, the cell can recognize that virus as non-self, and they can stimulate def a defense mechanism. So this is less of an inflammation and more of combating this invasion. The inflammatory cells are going to, uh, or sorry, the inflammatory cytokines are going to be released and they're going to uh, stimulate even more cytokine release. This is going to dilate the blood vessels. And when we do that, we're gonna recruit more and more cells. So your body is basically panicking. It's like, I need help, something's wrong. Someone come help me out. And that is what you do when you want to secrete a chemokine or a cytokine. It's an attractant, right? But intracellular immune responses do not necessarily involve inflammation. As I told you guys, they are more of combating an invasion. So I talked a bunch about TLRs. What about RLRs? RLRs, you can take the R from here and with the R from here for RNA and viral RNA intermediates. Now, TLRs can also recognize RNA viruses, but they recognize double-stranded RNA viruses. NLRs are going to recognize complex sugars on fungi and typically will form inflammasomes. What is an inflammasome? We'll get to that, just hold that thought. So the actual function of a pattern recognition receptor is to activate tyrosine kinases, which is basically going to lead to a huge downstream activation of all of the possible pathways. It's going to promote phagocytosis, right? Because we recognize that there is some kind of PAMP or a pathogen that we need to get rid of. And it's going to activate macrophages and dendritic cells. Why would it do that? In order to, once again, promote the phagocytosis. It is also going to promote cytokine production, whether that is pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory cytokines. When do we have an anti-inflammatory cytokine? Can you guys think of any example for me?
lipoxin. Okay. I'm not a asking the type of anti-inflammatory. I'm asking when would you secrete an anti-inflammatory cytokine? Think about pathology. With damps. Perfect. Yes. Good job. Specifically when I have apoptosis. For necrosis, it's going to be a completely different story. But for apoptosis, this is very controlled. It's Everyone knows this is going to happen. It's the course of life, let's say. So when apoptosis happens, the body might originally freak out, but then it's like, no, no, let's let's calm down. We know what's happening. Like, just let me secrete some anti-inflammatory cytokines. Pro-inflammatory cytokines are almost always going to be in response to a pathogen or in response to something abnormal happening. And some pathogens are going to use the not like receptors and form an inflammasome, which activates interleukin-1 and interleukin-18 zymogens. Now, what does that mean? I just put a bunch of nonsense on you guys. But when not like receptors see their respective antigens that have come into the cell, they aggregate into a complex, which is known as an inflammasome. So you guys can see that here we have a bunch of nod like receptors, right? This is an odd like receptor. This is an odd like receptor. They're going to all join together and form basically a helicopter, helicopter. Anyways, uh, this inflammasome or our helicopter type of shape is going to cleave the inactive portion of a protein in order to activate it. Now, we've seen that very often. You guys have just finished endorepro. You guys know all about that. But immunology is fancy, so we're going to have to call them zymogens instead of pre-pro-proteins. So these zymogens are essentially inactivated proteins. And once they are activated or once they are cleaved by these nodal like receptors, they're going to start secreting two types of cytokines, interleukin-1 and interleukin-18, both of which are pro-inflammatory cytokines. All right. So once they have been cleaved, they get secreted into the blood and they can generate an inflammatory response by dilating the blood vessels and attracting other immune cells. Now, what did we say NLRs respond to? NLRs recognize complex sugars on fungi and they typically form inflammasomes. Now, fungal reactions are kind of nasty when you guys like really get to know them so it's so important for the body to be aware that there is something wrong going on and by releasing those pro-inflammatory cytokines i am making the entire body aware that okay there is a pathogen there's something wrong with me i need some help and with that we have finished the first lecture do you guys have any questions on anything i've explained so far All right, uh, no questions, I think. All right, would you guys like to take a break or are we good to keep going? Okay, I got one, let's continue. I need at least two people. Keep going, all right, perfect. Let's move on to our next lecture, which is antibodies and antigen. Now, starting from actually even in the last lecture, I kind of rearranged the things within the lecture a bit just to have the flow of ideas work better, at least to me, like when I'm explaining. For example, in the previous lecture, uh, Dr. Garwin had placed the types of cells after all the inflammasome and tolic receptors and all of that, but I felt like having it in the beginning would help you guys relate the type of cell with everything happening. So the same thing is gonna happen for both of the coming lectures as well. I changed the order of things around a bit, but I include everything at least to the best of my ability as far as I can. All right, so for antigens and antibodies or antibodies and antigens, when I say antibody to you guys, what do you get in mind? Like, what, what do you think about? I 
I told you guys I want this to be an interactive session. Just have your keyboard on all the time. All right, perfect. They bind to antigens and they target antigens. Perfect. But what is an antigen that you guys are talking about? An antigen is a molecule, malignity, foreign particulate matter, or an allergen such as pollen that can bind to a specific antibody. Now, when I say antigen, you can think about just about anything. A bacteria, a bacterial fragment, a virus, even our own bodies can sometimes be perceived as antigenic. So antibodies are what respond to those antigens. And we have two main types of antibodies, circulating antibodies or fixed uh, B cell receptor antibodies, all right? Those circulating ones can either be, uh, oh no, sorry. <laughs> I, I meant the circulating can be two types. It can either be in free floating in the plasma or it can be attached to the B cell as a B cell receptor, all right? Now they are always, always, antibodies are always produced by B lymphocytes in response to an antigen. And these antigens act basically as mediators of the humoral immunity against all classes of microbes. So they activate our immune response. Each B cell only ever takes one antibody with one specificity. And it recognizes a specific antigenic epitope or a foreign molecule structure and a specific site of that antigen. All right. Now, when I want to study the antibodies and their reactions and the antigens, all of this is called serology. So when in micro, you guys here, we're going to do serological testing. We are just checking antibodies. We're checking antigens. We're checking titers, right? Now, do you guys remember who this was? One of our play characters. Babysitter, perfect. All right, so this is our B cell. After a B cell progenitor matures and it exits the bone marrow, although it's, it's functional, it hasn't yet been exposed to any antigens. So think of a B cell like us after we graduate, right? We go out into the world, we're like, oh my God, I have finally gotten my degree. I am a doctor now. This is amazing. And then you go to residency and you have no idea what you're doing. It's a scary truth, but it is the truth. So a B cell gets out of the bone marrow, does it immediately recognize every possible antigen? Of course not. It does have an antibody, but that antibody is not specific whatsoever because it has never been exposed to an antigen. It doesn't really know what it's looking for. That's like me telling you, go fetch me that thing. You have no idea what you're actually looking for, but you're trying your absolute best to find it for me. So antigens recognized by a specific B cell receptor on a naive B lymphocyte activate the cells to differentiate into a plasma cell. Now, what does that look like? We have a naive B cell, us immediately after we graduated. We can either become plasma cells or memory cells. Plasma cells, as you guys see here, are secreting those structures here, which for now, let's just call them a uh, gamma, right? Because it looks like the uh, great gamma. So let's just call them gamma for now. This memory B cell is really holding onto this gamma shaped thing though, it's not letting it go. So the same thing happens with our naive B cells. They either become plasma cells, which are actively fighting off the infection, or after this infection wears off, these plasma cells become dormant memory B cells, or they just disappear completely. They expire uh, as per Dr. Ruban. So what is this weird inverted Y shape, this gamma thing that I'm talking about? This is our immunoglobulin. And the reason why I said Y or gamma is because it can also be called a gamma globulin, an immunoglobulin, or an antibody. So if you see any of those names, it means the same thing. Now, why were they actually called gamma globulins? Obviously not because of their structure, that would be too convenient. No, they were named gamma globulins because on hemoglobin electrophoresis, 
we are going to start to see that the smallest protein with the highest negative electrical charge is this gamma protein. So they're called immunoglobulins because they are globins and blood proteins that have immunological activity. We have various different types of immunoglobulins, and I'll be going over a very detailed discussion about them, inshallah. But for now, I want you guys to just very briefly be familiar with their names. So we have five different classes of antibodies. These classes can also be called isotypes, right? These isotypes include IgM. So I want you guys to think of M for a mother. She freaks out for you. She's your first responder. She immediately jumps to your rescue, right? So this is a major antibody and a primary response, and it fixes complements. Now, what is that? I will be discussing it, inshallah, on Thursday session, and we'll go over everything about the complement cascade. But just keep it in mind for now that IgM plays a role in complements, just like your mother would compliment you whenever you do something good. IgG is kind of like your grandma. It's a bit slower, but she aims well. And if you know, you know, like she's, she's very specific with when she wants to attack. So your grandmother is the major antibody in a secondary memory response. It also fixes complements, but it opsonizes antigens and it can cross the placenta in pregnancy. What opsonization is, I will be covering in details. IgA is the most abundant antibody made. So A, abundant. And it is usually, you're gonna find it in the mucous membranes and mucosal tissue and the linings of epithelium. And we don't typically see it much or it doesn't pop up much unless we have some sort of, let's say, offense to those natural barriers that we have, which are, which are our first signs of defense. Now, IgE, I think of it as eggs, and some people are allergic to eggs. I don't know. There isn't really much to, to say in this regard, but it's usually in, involved with allergic reactions. What else starts with an E? Our eosinophils, which are also very commonly involved with allergic reactions. Finally, we have our IgD, which is mostly membrane bound, and it's typically just in fetal life. You don't really have to know much about it, if anything at all. Okay. They might seem very foreign uh, to us now, but we will be getting back to them and revisiting them consistently. Now, what is an antibody? What is an immunoglobulin? This gamma shape that we have, this Y shape, is composed of four separate proteins, two large proteins and two small proteins. All right, this small protein is called a light chain, and this very large protein is called our heavy chain. Our light chain has two classes, either kappa or lambda, and each antibody molecule has two identical kappa or two identical lambda light chains. So what that means is, if I were to split this down the middle, both of those would be exactly identical. This is a symmetrical image, all right? So, both the light chains, which we have here, or those small proteins, and the heavy chains, which are the large proteins, are divided into two regions. A variable region, which you guys can see here, and I will be discussing very shortly, inshallah, and a constant region. So this variable region is the amino terminal end, and this constant region is the carboxy terminal end. And those constant regions have essentially the same amino acid sequence in all the antibody molecules of the same uh, of the same class or isotype. So what that means is that this constant region that I have here is going to be the same for all IgM, for all IgG, for all IgA, for all IgD, and you guys get the, the point. Now what about this variable region? From its name, it varies, right? It, it changes up a lot. And because of that, this is typically where we're going to be having our antigen binding. Because what is the job of an antibody? We want to go to this antigen, we want to bind it, and then we want to inform our T cell that, okay, I, I caught it, like he's here, I, I know who he is. 
or we actually put that antibody on the pathogen itself and we tag it, okay? So I want you guys to keep those two in your mind. So we either present the antigen in and of itself to the T cells, or we're going to tag the antigen with our antibody for other cells to see, like it's wearing a crown of shame, let's say, okay? Now, aside from constant and variable region, we also have this FC region and this FAB region, which are separated by a hinge region, which kind of looks like a door hinge and it has flexibility. So the FC portion of the antibody molecule is the constant region of the heavy chain. It does not include anything about the light chain. And this is where the biological activity of the antibody is confirmed, because as I mentioned, this is where we determine whether this is IgM, IgG, so far, so forth. And this can also decide whether the antibody is involved with direct killing, like complement activation, or it's going to enhance phagocytosis by tagging it for other cells to see that this is abnormal for us. The FAB region is involved with antigen recognition. These chains okay, within, within uh, this FAB region are held together using disulfide bonds. And the cysteine residues at the hinge region allow the flexibility of this antigen binding site. So we can spread this open in order to bind, let's say, an antigen right here and one right here. So we can open up this hinge a lot more to try to bind both of those antigens. Or if I have two antigens that are super close to one another, we can close up this hinge and still bind both of the antigens. Okay? This is basically what gives us our flexibility. This is what gives us our ability to bind various different antigens all at once. But since I told you guys this is a symmetrical image, then you have to be sure that the antigen binding site on this side is going to be the exact same as the antigen binding site on this side as well. So if it were to have this particular shape, the antigen that binds to it has to fit into this configuration. All right. Now, looking more closely into the FAB region, which is really what we care about because it's where we have this antigen binding, the amino acids within the FAB region are highly variable in, that, in their amino acid composition, obviously, because we need to cover a huge range of antigens, right? We need to constantly be able to make this variable region variable. It's composed of this VH and this VL. So this VH is for the heavy chain and this VL is for the light chain. Every antibody has hypervariable regions which reflect the changes in amino acid sequence and the shape of that recognition segment within the antibody. Now, what does that mean? What are hypervariable regions? I told you guys about the fact that we have this hinge that can open and close. Well, we need more. If I'm not really changing the configuration of the antigen binding site, then how am I supposed to bind anything? So Using those finger-like projections that you guys see over here, which are known as complementarity determining regions, or just CDRs, they are going to give us this change in configuration, and they're going to create the binding site. So they're for antigen binding and recognition, and they will fit the 3D antigen configuration. So far, so good. Is everyone on track? Does that make sense? All right, perfect. Now, I mentioned to you guys that we have two main types of B cell antigens, right? Antibodies, sorry. Our antibodies can either be bound to the B cell itself, which basically means that it just has a long stalk that anchors it to the plasma membrane, or it can be free floating in the plasma, right? Now, looking here, what was this for us? This was our FAB region, right? This was where we had our VH and VL. This is where we had uh, the different um, hyper variable strains that we had, right? So here you guys can see that it, it's kind of circular. It's kind of going around itself. And what those loops do is that they are critical for antigen recognition or CDR3 
regions are critical for this antigen recognition because they consistently try to spin and they're looping around themselves and they're the most variable and crucial antigen recognition sites, okay? Because they're consistently looping around themselves. They're consistently trying different configurations of themselves. They're going to be very variable and they're going to detect more antigens and be more specific to the antigen whenever they do uh, uh, approach it. Now, going back to our antibody isotypes, based on the amino acid sequence in the constant region, which is the FC region, which I told you guys was on the bottom of the Y, we can have IgM, IgG, IgA, IgE, or IgD. And we all know what those are by now, but the heavy chain C regions of all antibody molecules of one isotype or subtype are identical. And their amino acid sequence is different to the antibodies of other isotypes or subtypes, okay? Looking at them here, we can see that secreted IgM and IgA can form multimeric complexes. They don't look like what we were just looking at. Those do, yeah, sure, they look like a Y, but why does this look like it's two Ys stuck together? Why does this look like it's five? Well, because they actually are. They're going to form multimeric complexes in which two or more antibody molecules can join by the FC region, all right? So our FC region can have us bind to other antibodies. IgM can be secreted as pentamers, hexamers. It can have so many, but IgA can only ever be two, okay? The antibodies are joined together by their FC region by a protein called the joining chain, all right? So you guys can see it here. This that we see here is the joining chain or the joining protein. Now, IgE and IgG isoforms are bivalent monomers. What? I just told you it's, it's one. How can it be bivalent? Well, because it has a symmetrical image on either side, it's gonna bind one antigen here and one antigen here, so it is bivalent. What would IgM be? I have no idea, like hexavalent uh, something. It's, it's just insane, okay? Like it is too much. For IgM, if we were to look at it alone, it is the first antibody, as I told you guys, and think of it as the first responder. So it's kind of like the innate antibody response. And it's not very specific. Although it has all of this for show, it's not really specific. It's just gonna slam on things. It's gonna hit anyone, okay? As for the IgG, as I told you guys, this is the grandma, so it's more specific and knows what it's going for. And this type of antibody is produced after recovery from an infection or when you're encountering an infection that you already took the vaccine for. So it's not the primary one that you face. It's what you face afterwards. Okay, for IgA here, sorry, IgA, as I told you guys, A for most abundant, but it's not really found in the blood much. That's because, as I told you guys, it sticks to the mucous membranes and it's excreted in the sweat and saliva and breast milk, and it's important in protecting the mucosal linings. IgE, E for eosinophil, E for egg allergy, it's very important in allergic reactions, okay? The chat is too big. I can't see the screen. <laughs> All right. Uh, it induces also, because I told you guys what, eosinophils, they have the, that, their freckles, right? And they have their granules. So they will also induce degranulation to release chemicals like histamines, to release other things, and to just stimulate the antibody response. Now, why are they different? If I'm just saying that, okay, at the FC region, there's a constant in every type, what makes them different? The differences in the FC chain in and of itself. For IgM, we have mu. For IgG, we have gamma. For IgA, we have alpha. For IgE, we have epsilon. And for IgD, we have delta. The letters make so much more sense when you guys correlate them to the FC chain that you have, okay? So the FC chain, which is the constant region, which is that what actually determines it, is different in every different type of isotype. Now, I just told you guys that IgM is not very specific. It's not very 
targeted, let's say, but it binds to so many things. And I told you guys that IgG is a lot more specific, even though it binds less things. How could that be? We would need to look at the avidity, affinity, and valency of those in order to understand. So we have... It's lagging. All right. So the affinity of the antibody is basically the strength of the binding. I know this like might be a bit confusing, but try your best to follow along with me. So affinity is how strong you can bind that antigen, all right? Now you can bind it using various types of non-covalent interactions, like antibody binding to antigens with van der Waals forces, electrostatic interactions, hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, it doesn't really matter. What matters is how strong is the affinity of this antibody to the antigen. The avidity is the capability of binding. Now, what does that mean? Let's say that I am already bound. I'm already full, right? I already have everything. I'm, I don't know what more to do. Like I've, I've already reached my capacity. And it's the number of interactions based on the epitopes. So let's say I was presented with a specific pathogen. Let's say I was presented with a specific antigen. If I were to look at that antigen, I'm going to be like, okay, that is an antigen, but I don't recognize anything on it. I don't actually see anywhere where I can bind. In that case, I have a low avidity. The valency is when the immunoglobulin is able to bind to so many different antigens, right? So when you have something that's polyvalent, you're going to have an IgM response, right? Because it's the only one that can possibly bind this many antigens. If I'm saying bivalent, I'm talking about pretty much anything. Even IgA could possibly be bi bivalent. Even IgM could be bivalent if we only have two antigens. But if I were to occupy all the sites, then I would have IgG, IgA, and IgD. When I'm considering a monovalent type of interaction, this doesn't mean that I'm occupying all the sites or that there is actually an antibody that only has one binding site. It just means that I am only binding one site, all right? What would that be? A possible reason is that the antigens might be too far apart for the hinge region to actually be able to extend enough and be able to bind both of them. Does that make sense? All right. So given everything that I just told you guys, I want you to tell me the difference between a primary and a secondary infection. So in a primary infection, what is the main isotype I'm gonna see? Perfect, IgM. In a secondary infection, what is the main isotype I'm gonna see? IgG, all right, perfect. So the affinity of IgM, is it is it high, is it low? low okay why is it low because as i told you guys it's not very specific right it's just it's just binding to whatever however in a secondary response where i have igg my affinity is going to be very high in a primary response am i going to have participation of memory cells no perfect okay and the final one i mean we could try i'm not sure if you guys would would know it but we could try I mentioned to you guys serology, and I mentioned to you guys titers, and I mentioned to you guys the ability of finding antibodies. So do you guys think that in a primary response, we're going to have a slow or a fast titer of antibody? If you don't know, that's completely OK. I haven't gone over it yet. OK, fast. Anyone else? All right, so I understand why you'd assume fast because this is your first time seeing this infection, right? It's, it's something that's super serious. I have to act very quickly. But actually, 
Remember how in the plot I told you guys that the main problem is that our adaptive immune system is sleepy. It's, it's falling asleep. And our innate immune system is trying its best to wake it up. So in a primary infection, we're going to have a slow detection of peak titers of antibody in the serum because we just have not produced those antibodies yet. However, in a secondary infection, we're going to be on our tippy toes. We're like, yeah, I've seen this. I know what to do. So we're going to have a fast detection of peak titers of antibody in the serum. I want you guys to think of, let's say, chicken pox, right? The first time you have it, it takes a while for you to heal. But the second time you have it, you don't even notice. You don't even manifest symptoms. And that's because your immune system is going to respond very, very quickly. All right. Now, I mentioned to you guys a bunch of different antibodies, but most of our antibodies, based on the recognition of epitopes, are called polyclonal antibodies. What does that mean? And what does a monoclonal antibody mean? Looking at this picture here, we have this antigen that has a bunch of different epitopes or antibody binding regions, let's say for now. And if I'm a polyclonal antibody, I could bind to multiple different epitopes on this antigen. I don't have an issue with that. But if I'm a monoclonal antibody, I can only bind to a single epitope. I'm super, super, super specific. Now, why are monoclonal antibodies important? For any of the third years here with me, we know why this is important because you are going to have them in almost every single pharma lecture and you're going to start having them in chemotherapy at the end of this book. So monoclonal antibodies are mainly used in therapy, all right? And they're mainly used in diagnosis. So where do we get those monoclonal antibodies from? Typically, they're not found in the human because most of our antibodies, as I mentioned, are polyclonal, but we can culture them from mice and then use those to try to better our immune system and to try to mediate the immune response. And those epitopes will only be recognized as, as I said, by one antibody and they are monoclonal. So the CDR regions are going to be very specific to a very specific epitope, all right? Now I keep mentioning epitope, epitope, epitope. What are epitopes? First of all, an epitope is basically a small portion of the antigen. And it's the antigenic determinant where we can have the binding of the antibody. Because an antibody is a lot smaller usually than a very, very huge antigen, unless the antigen itself is super, super tiny, which we're gonna get to in a second. But if we have this huge antigen, we cannot possibly bind to the entire thing. We need a specific site in order for us to be able to determine that, okay, this is how I know that this is a foreign material. And that is called an epitope. An antigen that is large enough to be recognized through an epitope and to elicit an immune response is called an immunogen, all right? So those are capable of activating lymphocytes and they're capable of stimulating the immune response immediately. However, sometimes we might have antigens that are too tiny, right? They're, they're too small for them to possibly elicit an immune response. And that brings us to haptins. Haptins are molecules that are antigenic, but they are too small on their own to elicit an immune response. So what they do is that they bind to a carrier molecule. And now this can present as a complete antigen to our antibody. So looking at this here, you guys can see that this is like a bunch of tiny, tiny antigens. They're not really causing much of a fuss, but when I cluster them together, when I put them all together, they do definitely give me some kind of lymphocytic response. Now, everything that I've been talking about so far, I've been talking about the binding to the antigen, but after I do bind to the antigen, what could happen? What am I going to do? The immunoglobulins themselves can actually cause a lot of damage. They don't have to refer to anyone else. They don't have to ask for anyone's help. Our babysitter has herself handled. 
So we have four main mechanisms. The fourth one is complement or the membrane attack complex, which I'll be covering separately in a lecture, so I didn't include it here. So we'll be talking about three main mechanisms. The first one is opsonization. Opsonization basically means that after this pathogen gets tagged by an antibody, so this antibody binds to an, an antigenic epitope on this antigen, it and it gets dispelled from the B cell, or it might have already been a free floating in the plasma antibody, it's going to tag this pathogen. And when it tags it, it makes it so much more attractive to macrophages. It makes it so much more, it's like the, the spice on top for our hungry boy. So the macrophage is going to recognize that F C region particularly, because you're not really supposed to be seeing this FC region just tagged onto something, except it's if it's within the B lymphocyte, right? So opsonization is the process upon which macrophages get activated by the FC receptor, uh, the FC region, sorry, using their FC receptor, and they can phagocytose this pathogen because it was tagged. Neutralization is what happens with vaccinations. So viruses need to find a way in, right? They need to be able to like go into the host immune system. They need to be able to like find a way in. But if I already took a vaccine, I have the antibodies ready against this virus. And what happens is that all of the antibodies are gonna bind to the virus and they're gonna make it basically impenetrable, right? It cannot even go into the cell at this point because there's nothing exposed from it. This is the process of neutralization and it's very typical in vaccines like influenza and SARS, which we use for COVID. So a virus will not be able to bind to the cell and thus you are neutralizing the reaction that is possible from this. Okay, now we have what is known as the antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. From the name, we have a cytotoxic type of reaction that is dependent upon an antibody. Now, our natural killer cell doesn't usually need to have an antibody. It can just recognize an abnormal MHC, right? It can be like, oh, this is non-self, or this cell isn't even representing an MHC whatsoever. However, when we have an antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, it's pretty much exactly the same as opsonization, but instead of a macrophage, we have a natural killer cell. And instead of phagocytosis, we're going to have cytotoxic killing of the cell itself. Do you guys remember what our natural killer cell looked like? He was this pretty buff dude, and he's just ready to kill someone. He's not, he's not going to eat them and do that whole thing. He's ready to just kill someone and promote apoptosis of this pathogen. Now, our B lymphocyte antibodies can very broadly be categorized into the innate form and the specific form. The innate form does not mean that they are part of the innate immune system, just that they are present at birth. They are part of your innate repertoire. They are part of your entourage, let's say. They start off in the fetal liver, and then during adulthood, most of them will die, but some of them remain dormant in the spleen. They make IgM without any antigen specificity, all right? So they are natural antibodies with random specific specificities. They are already preformed. Like you're not making new ones, which is why they're considered innate. B2 antibodies are specific antibodies. They are produced for that specific pathogen or for that specific antigen. And so they're gonna have a much higher affinity and a much longer memory. And because they get help from our four-year-old boy, our T-helper cell, they are called T-dependent B antigens. They require activation. Our B1 innate cells don't really do that. They're like, nah, I've, I've got this covered. I don't need any help. So they are our T-cell independent B antigens. Based on those antibodies and based on how vast they are, we can have different susceptibilities to illness. So someone that has a huge varied B cell repertoire, they're not gonna get sick as easily because their antibodies are readily accepting those antigens and they're readily dealing with them, right? So an antibody repertoire is a collection or panel of antibody specificities. And the more specific they are and the more varied they are, the more like 
we have, the better the outcome is for our patient or for ourselves. And with that, I finished the second lecture. Do you guys have any questions at all? Am I going too fast? Is anything unclear? I don't mind repeating anything whatsoever. I could I could go over the entire thing again if I need to. If there's a specific way that you guys like aren't understanding from, it's okay. Like I'll change my way of explanation. But if everything's good so far, just let me know. All right, would you guys like to take a break or should we keep going to the third and last lecture of today? Let's push through, all right, let's go. Final lecture of the day. This lecture was actually the one I received the most complaints about. Uh, so many of you guys told me that, oh, like this one is, is very confusing with the VDJ recombination and all of that. So I tried my best to simplify it to a disgusting amount. Like it is as simple as I could possibly make it. But once again, if there's anything you don't understand, I will try to simplify it even further. Our B cells are part of our lymphoid cells, right? And our lymphoid cells are either produced or stored within primary lymphoid organs. Within those primary lymphoid organs, like the bone marrow for B cells and the thymus for T cells, we're gonna have proliferation, rearrangement of the antigen receptor genes and selection for which are actually good enough to be sent out and which need to get reevaluated. So the majority of B lymphocytes arise from the adult bone marrow progenitors that initially do not express any immunoglobulins, okay? These precursors develop into immature B cells that express membrane-bound IgM. Then they will leave the bone marrow to mature further, mainly in the spleen. So the spleen is a secondary lymphoid organ. Within the spleen, you're going to start to have follicular B cells, which express IgM and IgD. And the reason for that, you guys don't have to know right now. You will learn more about it later on. But for now, just know that from the bone marrow, the naive, immature B cells that we have are going to have membrane-bound IgM. And then when they mature into follicular B cells in the spleen, they're going to express IgM and IgD on their cell surface. So I was talking to you guys about how every B cell only ever has one type of antibody, but do they only ever bind one type of antigen? What do you guys think? No, okay, perfect. The reason you guys could think of is I just mentioned to you guys different epitopes, right? I just mentioned to you guys this huge antigen. So if my B cell could only bind to one antigen, it's going to limit me so much. And I'm really not going to be able to fend off any sort of infection because I'm too busy trying to get the perfect, perfect fit. So with regards to antibodies, they can bind to any antigen that looks like their variable region, their CDR, their FAB region, regardless of how close that structure is, as long as it fits. So that means that it's not necessarily a very high affinity, but it can happen, right? The reason why I'm mentioning this is because sometimes our body is going to recognize our own personal organs and be like, no, that, that looks like an antigen to me. That looks like my antigen, actually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight that. that that's, that's not me. And that happens in, I'm gonna link you guys to micro a bit. 
think of strep pyogenes infection, when you have the secretion of this M protein that is very structurally similar to some proteins on your heart, the immune system is going to be like, oh, that looks just like my antigen. I need to attack it. And you're going to have what's known as rheumatic fever. All right. So this is known as molecular mimicry. Certain molecules are going to mimic each other and they're going to have very similar antigenic properties. And because the B cells are not specific to one antigen, they can bind anything that looks somewhat similar. However, they can only ever have one type of antibody. And within one B cell, you can only ever express one type of allele. So you take an allele from the father and an allele from the mother, but you can only ever actively express one of them. The reason for that is if I were to express both of them, that would just be very chaotic. The B cells themselves might start to recognize each other and be like, oh, like you're foreign. So allelic exclusion is very important and it limits our immune system in the sense that we don't have to consistently face a bunch of different antibodies and a bunch of different antigens. Now, how does a B cell develop? Once again, we have our babysitter here. She's 19 to 20 years old, but let's go back to her origins. Let's go back to her as a fetus. She started off as a common lymphoid progenitor. A common lymphoid progenitor within the bone marrow can either become a T cell or it can go into the B cell lineage. With regards to B cells, it starts off as a progenitor B cell, okay? So we had a common lymphoid progenitor. We're gonna have a progenitor B cell. This progenitor B cell, it's going to undergo heavy chain arrangement and convert into a precursor B cell. So a pre B cell and a pro B cell. A progenitor B cell is going to get heavy chain arrangement, the heavy chain that we had in our immunoglobulins in order to become a precursor B cell. Now, I'm just saying heavy chain. I'm not talking about anything light chain. So what happens to the light chain then? Our light chain rearrangement will convert our precursor B cell into a full-on immature B cell or an, our naive B cell that can be secreted into the blood. Okay? So... Progenitor B cell or pro B, B cell, they do not express surface IgG, but they showcase the B cell markers, which are, I told you guys, she's about 19 to 20 years old. She's our age, so 19 and 10. This progenitor cell does not include IgG, but after the heavy chain arrangement, and it, it's becoming a precursor cell, will have an, IG, an Ig, sorry, not an IgG, okay? So once it does have this immunoglobulin, it always, always starts off with the mu FC region. So this is going to be IgM, okay? I told you guys we don't have anything about light chains here yet, but the heavy chains alone are not stable enough. So we need to give them like something to just keep them waiting. We give them a surrogate light chain to keep them calm. This precursor B cell is also going to have two signaling proteins, which are Ig alpha and Ig beta. What those are, I'll get back to in a second. Finally, we have our immature B cell or our naive B cell that I already told you guys about. And I already told you guys, uh, it's gonna start circulating around the body. It's gonna start immunosurveillancing to try to find an antigen in order for it, it to actually no longer become naive in order for it to differentiate into a plasma cell or a memory cell. So let's take each of those steps and try to look at them in more detail. A heavy chain rearrangement basically means that when a progenitor B cell in the bone marrow receives signals to start making a functional B cells, it's going to start looking at its genomic sequence. Its genomic sequence is going to include V, D, J, and C regions. All right, so there's specifically the CDR3, which are the hypervariable regions, are going to include those, right? Because we already said the FC region is predetermined and how it is predetermined, I will mention in a second. But this variable region, this diversity region, and this junctional re region are all going to give us our FAB region, right? What about the C? Because a lot of you guys 
we're saying, I have no idea why it starts off with IgM. It doesn't really make any sense, right? And how do we possibly have other types of immunoglobulins if we always start off with IgM? Now, looking at it, I want you guys to just think of it this way. This is the longest possible one, right? This is IgM. This is our multivalent one. It, it attaches to so many different things. If I cut some of it off, I just cut this off. It's going to switch to a different class. I cut this off. It's going to switch to a different class. So as I shorten it, as I change uh, its exon sequence, I can switch classes. How does this happen? This can happen by external stressors or mainly and specifically by T and B cell interactions, which you guys will have an entire lecture about that's not included in the midterm, okay? So going back here, that region that I just showed you guys for the IgM is our constant region, okay? What happens during this VDJ rearrangement is that two enzymes called RAG1 and RAG2 will begin to select a specific V, a specific D, and a specific J region, just haphazardly. They're just picking favorites, okay? And the reason why this is good is because we can have this very diverse repertoire, right? We're going to produce antigens, uh, antibodies, sorry, that are going to be very broad. They're going to be like, they're going to have so many different possibilities. The action of RAG1 and RAG2, it's, it's imprecise, as I told you guys. It's just haphazard. And they might even take out one or two nucleotides after they join the VDJ region. But this adds a degree of variability in the system. And this is called a combinatorial diversification. Let's do, let's say that again. So when I am combining my V, D, and J regions, my RAG1 and RAG2 are going to splice wherever they want. They're going to splice and join together the different regions. They first are going to join our DJ because they're being literal, literal DJs themselves. They're like remixing everything. And then they're gonna join the V or the variable region, okay? Once they do that, they're not being super specific about it. They're just being pretty haphazard. They're just picking whatever. They might take out one or two nucleotides as they do that. And this, in the combination, will give me combinatorial diversification, okay? Then, once I do have this VDJ, I would once again start to add or delete random nucleotides and the oppressor, let's say, the person that does that to this poor VDJ region is going to be our TDT or our terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase. You guys could just know TDT. You don't have to know the entire name. So TDT is going to act on this VDJ and it's going to start adding and deleting random nucleotides. And what this does is at the junctions specifically between those VDJ regions, and it's going to cause once again, a huge diversification, right? And this mechanism actually results in the largest contribution to the diversity of the antibody repertoire. This is called junctional diversification because at the junctions of the VDJ regions, I am just adding and removing nucleotides, however I please. Everything that I have here is a rough draft. It's not actually something that I'm going to start transcribing. So DNA dependent RNA transcriptase will transcribe this into a rough RNA message. And then through post-transcriptional modifications, all of these intervening and unwanted sequences are going to get spliced off, and you're going to have a joining with this C region. The C region is the constant region that I told you guys about, and the closest one to VDJ is the mu one, okay? And that is why we consistently start with IgM, and then we undergo class switching. So now, we have a precursor B cell with a heavy chain, but we don't have a specific light chain for it, right? We just are talked about the heavy chain. So the light chain is gonna be the exact same, except it will not include the D region, okay? So precursor B cells, what did we have before? We had progenitor B cells. Precursor B cells that already have a developed heavy chain FC region would be too unstable, as I told you guys, if they remain unbound. So we give them a surrogate 
light chain. Until we are able to have this light chain rearrangement, we do the whole VDJ, same thing. We use RAG1, RAG2, TDT, we get the constant region, we do all of that. But there is an extra degree of variability in our light chains. Why is that? I told you guys that our light chain can either be kappa or lambda, right? And because of that, we can have even more diversification. The humoral response can make such a wide diversity of antibodies through the random mutations that change the coding sequence and through the recombinations that we have. So if we were to now look back at our B cell development, if we were to look back at it, our progenitor B cell or our pro B cell is when we're gonna have the RAG1 and RAG2, VDJ recombination, TDT mediated addition, junk and nucleotides in order for us to form the heavy chain and get our precursor B cell. The precursor B cell is gonna get activated by co-receptors Ig alpha and Ig beta. Now, what is that? The B cell receptor is just an antibody that is anchored into the cell membrane of the B cell. And this intracytoplasmic region of the B cell receptor has no kinase activity. It's not actually really doing anything. It's just detecting. In order for it to do something, it needs to get co-activated by Ig alpha and Ig beta, which will trigger a downstream kinase activity. Okay? So in order to get the B cell to be activated, to start synthesizing and secrete an secreting antibody molecules, you need the action of co-receptors in the form of Ig alpha and Ig beta, which have kinase activity downstream. So when the B cell receptor sees the antigen, it's immediately going to call in Ig alpha and Ig beta to attach to it, which can then transduce phosphorylation signals into the nucleus, and it can then do the entire downstream signaling pathway in order to have a kinase activity of that specific antigen, uh, to that specific antigen, sorry. So without Ig alpha and Ig beta, the B cell will only stick to the antigen, but it won't be induced to make any antibodies. Our final thing is our immature B cell. Is Ig alpha and Ig beta always do kinase activity? Um, Every time that you want to stimulate this antibody on the B cell, if you're not able to have those core receptors, if you're not able to just consistently stimulate it, you're not even going to reach an immature B cell. Like you need to have those co-activators in order to kickstart the reaction of those antibodies in order to make them functional, basically, so that you can move on to an immature B cell. You don't necessarily need them, to my knowledge at least, you don't necessarily need them afterwards when you're using um, a, an immature B cell that has now become a plasma cell. You don't need the Ig alpha and Ig beta anymore. But in order to activate this antibody for it to be functional, as a precursor B cell, you need to have the core receptors Ig alpha and Ig beta. Does that answer your question? All right, perfect. Now, as I was talking to you, guys, uh, to you guys about, our immature B cell is now ready to go. It is in the bone marrow. It's so excited. It's like, oh my God, here we go. I am so ready to leave. But then the bone marrow is like, now nah, you, you, you still have one more final to go before you graduate. Let's, let's, let's see how you do. And so it makes it go through positive and negative selection. I'm sure you guys have done this before in HLS. Even if you don't really remember it much, it's completely okay. What negative selection and positive selection means is basically a final test before any lymphocyte is released into the blood. Now imagine the chaos that would ensue if you release a lymphocyte that reacts to the body itself. You would have an autoimmune reaction, right? because your body is attacking itself. So when I am looking at those B cells, I need to make sure I'm gonna expose them to self antigen. And then if they respond to the self antigen, I negatively select them. I'm like, no, you, you did not pass the step. You're gonna have to go back. We're gonna edit your receptor and we're gonna generate a new V chain so that you no longer attack self. After this receptor editing, or even initially, if it were to see a pathogen, if it were to see an abnormal cell, but not do anything, like it might bind to it, but it doesn't have any reaction, 
that is not going to help me, right? It's, it's a non-functional receptor. So in this case, I'm going to have a positive selection where the cell is going to be killed by apoptosis. And this is called clonal deletion. So negative selection, if it binds to self, positive selection, if it's not capable of binding to non-self. All right. So very briefly, to go over everything again, we start off with the VDJ DNA gene rearrangement using RAG1 and RAG2. And then we're going to have random nucleotide insertions and deletions using DDT. After transcription, we're going to have a precursor RNA. And after splicing, we're going to have our mRNA. Now, I mentioned to you guys that RAG1 and RAG2 will contribute to something known as combinatorial diversity. And those are the random combinations of the germline VDG gene segments that are mediated by RAG1 and RAG2. And basically, after the synthesis of antigen receptor proteins, combinatorial diversity is further enhanced by the matching of two different randomly generated V regions derived from the heavy um, chains and the kappa or the lambda light chains when we're doing the light chains, okay? So combinatorial diversity, when I am combining them, the VDJ, I am making some mistakes. And then also the, there is an added diversity due to the kappa and the lambda light chains. Now TDT, I told you guys, has a junctional diversity. So we have the random addition or deletion of sequences as the, at the junctions before they are united. And because of this junctional diversity, the antibody molecules show the greatest variability, even hyper variability, at the junctions of the V and C regions where the CD3 region is located. So between the VDJ and the constant region, this is where our CDR3 region is located. And this is where we're going to have the greatest variability. Believe it or not, you guys are done with three immunology lectures. Do you have any questions at all? IgA and IgB are made before light chains. So IgA and IgB are not like our typical immunoglobulins that we are producing. Uh, they are more for stimulation of the cells themselves. So they're not being made for that. They are just there and they secrete that. All right. I got one, no questions. Anyone else? All right. If you guys don't have any questions for me, then that's all folks. Please scan this QR code to give me your feedback so that I can improve for the next session on Thursday, inshallah, where we will be covering compliments and MHC. Uh, if you guys at any point need anything at all, I am more than happy to help, but I will be occupied because I have a midterm on Wednesday, so forgive me. But after that, I am more than happy to help you guys with anything that you need. And inshallah, your midterm is going to be amazing. I wish you the best of luck. And I really, really, really hope that this session was beneficial to you all. Please make sure that you scan this code. And my last slide is just to thank you with my number. You're going to get it anyway. Uh, so I'll just keep it on this. But that is all on my end. If you guys have any questions, I will be here. If not, then you are more than welcome to leave after you scan this QR code. Thank you all.